All right, fantastic, everyone. Well, I got us live and running and uh, recording. I want to welcome everyone that's attending online. Uh, you are, of course, on the Summit Alliance Advantage Tuesday training. Um, you know, every Tuesday we have these trainings. Of course, we do record them uh, for people, uh, you know, to gain access to them that cannot watch them live or that uh, do not have the uh, the schedule that allows for uh, logging in and viewing online. But uh, also, just also keep in mind the people that are online um, that are local. Uh, you know, these are designed for uh, you know people really outside of the DFW market. And uh, so if you can get here, you know, you can ask questions, you can interact, you can talk. You know, maybe there's something that you're thinking viewing the webinar that if you were in the class, you could have asked. So uh, just a little uh, heads up there uh, you know, on the purpose of the, uh, the webinars that we have. Um, last week, we did talk about final expense. Now, we primarily talked about setting appointments in the final expense market. Uh, this week, we're going to kind of continue on that, expand on that a little bit more. I'm going to do a brief recap. Of, uh, of what we went over last week. And uh, then we're also going to really get into um, what the most effective method in final expense as far as approach on your leads. And that's, uh, that's really door knocking, taking the, the final expense mailer, uh, you know, kind of uh, narrowing down your market and, uh, and uh, you know, going to the door because people are so receptive at the door. But we'll really get into that here shortly. Uh, you know, we talked a bit about what is final expense. You know, many of you know that. We'll do a brief recap on that. Um, you know, really the market that uh, we work in with final expense and along with that, you know, how do you market for clients? A little bit more about the leads. Again, a brief recap on that. Uh, as far as the carriers and, and products that support agents the best. And then again, as I mentioned, door knocking and uh, the, the door knock approach. Now, what is final expense life insurance? Again, many of you know, but just a brief recap, final expense insurance is designed to cover bills that they, your family, your loved ones are going to face upon your passing. Um, you know, there's uh, so many people think that maybe they have Social Security, but we know Social Security only pays $255 towards final expenses. Um, some people may think, well, I'm a veteran. I have uh, veterans benefits. And, you know, again, those are very limited on what they'll pay, just a few hundred dollars. Um, you know, so if someone hasn't taken the time to put their final expense in place, then more than likely they do not have the coverage. And, you know, coming up with 7000 or 15000 or whatever it is all at once for a family can be tough. You know, I'm sure there's probably people in the room that have had to come up or help pay for a funeral or maybe uh, uh, contribute to a GoFundMe page. But it's a lot easier for people to come up with $50, $60 a month to take care of their final expenses than it is to, uh, for the family to have to come up with thousands and thousands of dollars. So it's a great market. There's so many people to see. There's so many people to market to. And the fact that we can cover, uh, you know, major medical challenges, uh, you know, even if someone's had a heart attack and it's been over a year, we can still get them covered on an immediate death benefit. Uh, if someone has COPD, neuropathy, heart conditions, or maybe their bill is outside guidelines for the carriers. Again, we have products to meet all of these needs. And that's very important in the final expense market. You know, there are a lot of companies that offer final expense products. There are a lot of final expense products out there. Now, some of them are specifically designed for people that are totally healthy, which, you know, that's okay, but for us as agents working in the senior market, a lot of times you're dealing with, uh, you know, more medical challenges than not. Uh, you know, I'm sure most of you would agree. And, you know, so with that, you have to have the products that are going to allow you to cover the clients that you sit down in front of. So that kind of brings me to, you know, that's why we've really identified the products in the markets because these carriers that we work with, um, they have the underwriting for the business, which allows for these medical challenges. So if you run into someone that has COPD, we know that, uh, you know, we can still get them covered. A lot of agents in that situation, they would set, set their stuff down, pack their stuff up, and, uh, you know, I'm sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Client, um, due to your condition, you're not eligible for insurance, and they leave. So, again, we have an advantage there. We have products where we can cover these medical challenges. We ha even have guaranteed issue products if someone's challenge is so extreme they do not qualify for an immediate death benefit. Now, my clicker's alive here. Okay, I think my clicker... 
There we go. Okay, now, back on. Apologize for that. Now, as far as who do you sell final expense to, again, we know it's the senior market. Uh, you know, just looking back, and this kind of uh, goes into the uh, statistics a little bit. In 1999, the youngest baby boomer was 35 years old, and the oldest was 53. So in about January of 2011, more than 10,000 people a day will be turning age 65. So during the next 20 years, you're going to have a, just a large amount of people needing a whole range of financial products. Final expense is one of those. Again, 10 out of 10 people are going to pass away, right? We need to have our final expenses taken care of. Um, along with that, it's the senior market. It's one of the biggest wealth transfers that, that's occurring now. So again, in dealing with the senior market, we have products, we have carriers, we're able to take care of all of the needs that we run into. And what's great about the senior market, it's, it's, uh, it's a market that uh, you can use a lot of products. Of course, the final expense, whole life, cash value products, wealth transfer products. If someone has a nest egg that they're sitting on that they want to leave to their family, the best way to do that is through life insurance. And uh, the biggest reason is because of the tax advantages and all the stuff that they can avoid as far as probate, estate taxes, and things to that effect. So, uh, again, working in the senior market opens up so many doors to so many great products, and you're doing great things for the clients that you work with. And, you know, you're allowing them to uh, pass on a legacy to their family that they may not have been able to or maybe put their family in a better financial situation upon their passing because – I'm, you know, most people, uh, we've heard this statistic before, you know, or, or uh, two paychecks or a paycheck away, you, you know, from, uh, from just financial disaster. So, you know, you know, again, people that are prepared, uh, it's a lot more comfortable situation for their family, and they want to make sure that their family's not, you know, in, in such a uh, stressful situation. So just, just that understanding. Now, as far as marketing for final expense, this is important to understand because we have two primary ways to market for final expense. We generate our telemarketing leads, and we also have direct mail. Now, quick highlights on your telemarketing leads. These leads generate quickly. In most cases, you know, we can get them in about three to five days, sometimes about seven days or so. But again, generate very quickly. Leads are exclusive. We mention your name during the call. We record the call so you can hear that conversation between our telemarketer and the client. Uh, so whenever you call them, uh, they're expecting your call. They're expecting a call from John the agent, Jason the agent, right? Because that's, the re that's what the representative told them at the senior care center. We're going to have our agent by the name of Jason is going to be in touch with you in the next 24 to 48 hours. By the way, what is your favorite hobby? What is your favorite color? And they ask this as a security question. So when you call them, and we'll cover that briefly again in our script, you know, that's one of the first things that you want to identify. You know, I'm calling you, hi, Mrs. Smith. I'm calling you about final expense life insurance. You spoke to a representative at the Senior Care Center. You indicated your favorite color was blue or you like to go fishing, whatever the case may be. So this is a very inexpensive marketing option. This is probably one of the lowest cost leads to generate, and it's a great supplement to direct mail. I look at telemarketing leads as kind of a side dish. You're not really going to get full on telemarketing leads because there's a few factors which we'll cover, but it's a great supplement to direct mail. Direct mail is more of a consistent, um, just a solid way to market because you have more data to market to. Now, with your telemarketing leads, the close rate's about 10 to 30%. So if you get 10 of them, you know you're going to close one. Probably going to close two. You're doing very well if you close three. Now, if you close one, you're still profitable. That's what's great about the final expense market. If you close two, you're very profitable. If you close three, you're making about $10 for every dollar that you invested on the telemarketing leads. So again, you know, just putting you in a position to get a good return on investment. You know, we're, we're knowing how to market. We're knowing how to get in front of our clients. We know how to handle the clients. We know what products to use. Again, it just all goes hand in hand. Now, when we're talking about telemarketing leads, basically uh, the data consists of three main factors. And what's great about this uh, you know, adjustments need to be made to try to generate more data. We can do that as far as increasing the age to 85 sometimes uh, because we can cover up to age 85. So if we want to market to someone who's age 85, we can, can increase the age. Now, average ages are from 50 to 80. That's your final expense market. Income's under 50,000. Income's under 50,000 because in most cases, people – uh, that whose incomes are, are, you know, receiving incomes higher than 50000 may have already planned or done some type of preparation 
for final expenses. So again, we try to market to people with incomes under 50,000. Now, this is key to know here, area by county. The reason we generate telemarketing leads by county is because there's a thing called the do not call list. So unfortunately, if you have 100,000 people in the area that meets, say you have a city with 500,000 people, let's say 200,000 meet the demographics, ages 50 to 80, incomes under 50,000, but out of those 200,000 people, in most cases, you're looking at about 50 to 60% that are on the do not call list. So unfortunately, we cannot call to these people in market final expense. So in that situation, the only way is to utilize direct mail. Now, kind of skipping ahead, that's what allows you to market with direct mail by zip code because there's not a do not mail list. So you can mail to anyone. Now, kind of jumping into direct mail, one of the biggest advantages to direct mail is the fact that the client initiates the contact. The client has taken the time to fill out the letter and mail it back. Can we all agree that if you receive something in the mail, you're probably not going to send it back unless you're pretty interested in it. Is that right? In most cases. So also the leads are exclusive. You know, again, that's important. You know, working with our partnered agents, we have access to carriers and products. There's no reason to try and give the lead to agent A and then turn around and agent B, C, D, and on down the line. Agent A is going to be able to take care of that with the resources and products and training and tools that we all have available. It's consistent marketing. Again, I'll talk about the do not call list. Uh, you're limited on the amount of people that you can market to. Direct mail, there's not a do not mail list, so you can mail. You have plenty of data. We talk about over 10,000 people a day, so there's data constantly turning over to market to. So you always have people to market to with direct mail. Low cost mail rate, again, uh, with our partnered agents, we want to make sure that you can mail and be profitable. So we're helping with the mail cost. So you can go to any mail house, and you're not going to get a 39 cents per mailer rate. You know, you're going to get anywhere from, uh, what, what is it, like 46 cents to 59 cents per mailer for final expense, depending on the amount of mail that you mail. So considering we do large amounts of mail and considering we cover the cost, some of the cost, the percentage of the cost for our agents, that allows us agents to mail out for 39 cents per mailer. Again, very low cost to mail out. High, highest close rate of the two marketing tools. Again, I talk about 10 to 30% close rate with telemarketing. With direct mail, you're getting a 40 to 60% close rate. And that's being conservative because there's agents that are close, closing higher than 60% that are seasoned, that, are in the, in, that have been doing this a while. Because again, you got to keep in mind when someone has taken the time to mail a letter back to us requesting the product that we have, then, you know, we can easily, um, know that this person had a serious interest again. So a higher close rate with direct mail. Now, pretty much the same factors, data, um, ages 60 to 80. Now, if we need to increase the amount of people that we want to mail to in an area, we can lower this down to 50. We can increase it to 85. But primarily, we'll mail to 60 to 80. Incomes between 15,000 and 50,000 and area by zip code. This is key in how we handle the mail. Again, telemarketing, it's okay to call them and set the appointment because someone's already reached out to them by phone. But with direct mail, no one's reached out to them by phone. They filled out something they received in the mail. So they don't know how they're going to be contacted. So when you show up with that written invitation, that is what they have filled out, a written invitation for you to come talk to them about final expense. So when you show up with the written invitation, they see the letter that they received, that they filled out, they see their own handwriting. People are super friendly, and we'll talk about that here shortly. Um, you'll, you'll notice the little website below, UnitedStatesZipCodes.org. You know, if you want to look at some areas that you can market to that have a higher senior population, again, in dealing with final expense, that's going to allow you to identify other areas that you may not have thought about. So, again, you can, uh, you know, kind of go there and look at the demographics and, again, look for senior, high uh, population of senior markets. Now, again, real quick. You know, in appointment setting, you want to make sure you're comfortable and relaxed. You want to make sure you're in a good mood. You know, again, people want to set an appointment uh, with, with someone that, that's nice. They don't want to set an appointment with a person that's real cold and, and uh, boring. You know, make sure uh, you set up your surroundings. You know, again, be schedule ready. Uh, this means so much. You, you know, so many people will attempt to set some appointments 
or uh, you know, and something will come up and they'll go sit down to set a point. So, you know what, I'm going to take care of the laundry real quick or, you know, I might as well get the dog to the vet and then come or whatever the case, they always seem to find something else to do other than set appointments. So just when you sit down to set appointments, make sure your schedule's clear, make sure your surroundings, you're in a comfortable work type environment. You know, I, I set appointments for my home office all the time for many, many, many years. So, and again, you know, just set up your surroundings. Also, have your available appointment times ready to offer the clients. This sounds silly and easy, but it's true. So many people will sit down without a schedule in front of them and start to make calls. And, oh, I, I, oh you're going to set the appointment with me? Okay. Um, um, are you ready to set the time up? So, And also, this is going to help you. Say if you know that I can, I got time to run my appointments this Friday and Saturday. So I'm calling my clients to set up my appointments for Friday and Saturday. Well, what if your clients can't fit in your schedule? Then you need to have a rollover time. That's what I call it. You know, maybe a Sunday or a Monday alternative time, you know, Sunday evening, Monday evening, times where they more than likely are not going to be busy because maybe Friday and Saturday they got family activities. So, again, if you have your schedule ready and know when you're going to be able to set them, this is going to allow you to set your appointments more with more confidence. You know, be ready to take notes on the time so you can cover all the time frames. Uh, this was asked earlier right before the training, but, uh, you know, don't leave a message when you call your clients. Continue to try to get them on the phone because, again, they may misinterpret that message as you're a telemarketer, so every time they see your number, they're not going to answer it because you're, they, they think you're a telemarketer. They forget that you're calling in response to the request they made. Have alternate time frames, again, for people with busy schedules. I covered that. You know, don't get discouraged if first round doesn't fill your schedule. Be prepared to truly work the leads. Now, what I mean by that, you call through your stack of leads. You're calling through. Um, you get through your leads. You don't get any appointments. Take, you mark your times that you called everyone. Be ready to call again throughout the day. You know, I'll call in the morning, mid-morning, afternoon, mid-afternoon, evening, later in the evening if I have to. But I'm tallying all the times that I've called each individual lead. So next time I call them, I can narrow down a time that I'm more than likely going to catch them at home. Simple. Um, also, just a quick tip. As you call through your leads, if you don't get any appointments the first call through your stack of leads, flip them over, call through them again, but call each number back to back. The reason I say that is because if the client doesn't answer the phone the first time, more than likely we can all agree that it's because they think it's a telemarketer. But if this number calls them again, they're probably thinking, wow, why is this person calling me twice? It must be important. I better answer. So when they answer, oh, Mrs. Smith, I'm so glad I got you on the phone. This is Jason. I'm calling you about the request you made for your final expense benefits, and I go right into setting the appointment. Now, we talked about the appointment, and again, we trained on this last week. I just want to highlight uh, you know, some of the things that you need to focus on because when these are generated by phone from our telemarketing crew, they say senior care center. They say final expense benefits. And they'll confirm either a favorite color or a favorite hobby. So the reason you want to get this out in the first sentence is so you can overcome the I'm not a telemarketer objection. Because, again, you called the client. They picked up the phone. What are, what are people's first reaction when they answer the phone of a number they're, they don't recognize? Skeptical, exactly. They're trying to get this person off the phone. It's a telemarketer. I'm going to say anything I can to get this person off the phone as fast as I can. But if the, you identify with them before they can get you off the phone, because so many agents, this is where they miss it. They call the client, they're identified as a telemarketer, and they hang up the phone with the client before even getting the point across as to why they call. So be really, before the client can even say much, hey, Mrs. Smith, the reason for my call is, and I go right into it, and I identify those three specific points. And the reason I do that, again, is to overcome that I'm not a telemarketer. I only need about 10 to 12 minutes of your time. The reason I highlight that when I set my appointments, I don't want my clients thinking that I'm going to be out there three or four hours with the old insurance guy, right? You know, so many people, all oh, the dreaded insurance appointments. So I let them know right off the bat it's going to be a short and sweet appointment. You know, 10 to 20 minutes, we can see what we can get you qualified for, which day would work best for you. Notice I don't say, when can I come see you? What do you think they'd say if I say, when can I come see you? Never. Oh, I'm busy. I'm so busy, I don't know, never. But which day would work best for you, Friday or Saturday, or whichever days that you're setting your appointments? Now you've asked them a question that has an option that more than likely they're going to think about which day is going to work better for them, as opposed to, gosh, what would work better? And then all of a sudden their schedule hits them. 
So, you know, that's key. Which day would work best for you? Friday or Saturday? Okay, great. Which time? Have your times ready again. Uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll kind of put them together. You know, I have a time available Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock or maybe Saturday morning at 11. Which would work best for you? Again, I'm giving them two pinpointed times. You know, real quick, solidify the appointment. You want to paint a mental visual of your arrival. This helps the client remember that you're coming. It'll help reduce the amount of no-shows. Because what happens when they hang up the phone with you after you set the appointment? Life happens, right? <laughs> and in life, anything can occur. You know, they may get another phone call that may be about a trip that they're going to take with the long-lost friend or whatever. Anything could happen. So they may not have written it down, written it down or, or what have you. So uh, we do this to help paint that picture of our arrival. Real simple, confirm their address. You want to confirm their address. You know, I got you at 1124 Evergreen. Is this correct? Yes. Okay, great. Now, this is what I like to say. When I'm coming down your street and I'm looking for your house, will I see the address on the side of the house, on the mailbox, or will it be on the curb? Okay, great. What, what color of car will be in the driveway? Is your driveway out front? Okay, what color car is going to be there? Okay, great. I'll see there. Or I may say, what color is your house? But... Basically, the reason I'm asking them that is because they're going to answer me, and when they answer me, they're going to think about me driving down the street looking for their house, and that's going to help solidify that in their mind a little bit more. Again, you want to reduce the amount of no-shows. So, um, you know, any of these you can ask them and then confirm the time at the end, and it's really not a confirmation. It's a statement of confirmation. Great. We'll see you Saturday at 10. So, real simple. Now, this is how we handle telemarketing leads, right? It's okay to pick up the phone and call our telemarketing leads. Now, when we get a direct mail lead, how do we handle our direct mail leads? Door knocking. Reason being, it's a written invitation. Because if you try to call these, and just real quick story. Um, a lot of my production came from the mortgage protection market. Those are direct mail leads that you actually call on. I used to sit down every Tuesday and Wednesday, and I'd have my stack of leads, you know, 80 to 100 leads or whatever it is. I'm the man with the most leads wins, so I try to get a big stack of leads, and I'd sit there and I'd call through. And I'm calling through to set my appointments up for, you know, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, or whichever set of days that I planned on working that week, if I was going out of town or in town. But my point is, is I'd sit there and I'd get my appointments, and that's how I'd get all my appointments. I'd set up anywhere from 15 to 25 appointments every week, every weekend, Nonstop. That's that was my schedule. Now, mortgage protection. Of course, we all know what happened. You know, in in the burst, uh, right? 2008, 2009. Data uh, kind of decreased, so it was harder to get leads in mortgage protection. But it was easy to get leads in final expense. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna step in the final expense market. It's another simplified issue product, non medical product. We get our clients covered with that exam real quick. You know, very similar, but. There were more leads. So I got me, again, got a stack full of leads, got home, got to my home office, got everything ready. I sat down to set my appointments. I'm calling through. I'm not getting my appointments. I fell flat on my face, basically, with my first stack of leads. So I go back. Uh, this guy, Chris, we're a, lot, a huge part of our, you know, we spoke to him, uh, kind of like, what's going on? And I sit down, and uh, he, he tells me, he's like, I start to explain. I'm like, you know, I sat down, I got my schedule ready, I picked up the phone, I started, he's like, whoa, whoa, you did what? I, I picked up, no, no, the phone is not your friend in final expense. It's a phone barrier, it was especially with direct mail. So basically, I was shooting myself in the foot. So just by, that, just by understanding that, again, it's a written invitation. People are so much more friendly. When they see that letter that they received in the mail and filled out and mailed back, it totally changes things. They're communication with you is so much more open as opposed to, you know, trying to call them and, and remind them of a letter that they filled out. Seniors are bombarded with marketing for everything. So if you're trying to call them about a letter they filled out, you're going to have a harder time making that connection than you are if you just show up to the door with that written invitation. And again, we generate them by zip code. So you can route out your stops and go see your clients. Now, all in one zip code as opposed to you know, telemarketing, if they're generated by county, that's why it's ideal to set the appointments because you don't want to drive from one end of the county to the other. You want to keep yourself in an area. And, again, that's what, um, you know, direct mail will allow, allow you to do. Uh, I, so many of the agents, the, seems the common denominator in final expense 
is they will take their leads, their final, and, and they're out on the road. You know, I talk to some of our top producers, you know, almost all the time, and, and uh, every time I'm on the phone with them, they're out in the field. I don't hear the TV going in the background. I hear, I'm about to be at my next stop, or let me call you a little bit later, Jason, I'm about to be at my next stop, or, or you know, I, Jason, I just got four appointments out of this house. You're never going to believe what happened. I walked into the house. And uh, they weren't there. And next thing you know, the neighbor came out and asked if I could help. And I started talking to the neighbor. Telling him I was here, and I was in his house writing applications. So things happen when you get out there, you know. And you could utilize so many more tools. You know, there. You, everyone's heard of, you know, maybe the six four door uh, four house rule. You know, you go to the one house and you go to the neighbors and you go to the house across the street. You know, there's simple things that you could do. But with that invitation, with that letter in your hand, that changes that. So uh, again, just. Handling, you know, the right approach with, with uh, door knocking and direct mail is very important. And uh, so I wanted to cover that. But I want to bring up someone who, uh, who, who really teaches me. Y'all you know, heard me say this. I learned from him. Um, you know, if we were to put our final expense production head to head, he probably has me beat. But, uh, uh, you know, so I want to get him up. And, uh, you know, we've, we, we've learned some really solid, solid practices throughout the years. And, uh, you, you know, what's great about, and again, y'all heard us say this, we feel like we bring a large value to the table because we've been out there and done it. We've walked through the minefield. We know how to sit down with the client. We know what to say to them. We know what products to use. We know how to write the application. We know how to turn it in, follow it through the carrier to make sure it turns into a bank deposit. Absolutely. Yes, question. That's, that's a great question. Real quick, how do I follow up on someone that's not home when I door knock? There's a couple of ways. If no one answers the door, I just, I'll simply circle back. I'll tally that time on the back of the lead sheet just like I would if I were to call them, and I'll circle back around. Because, again, you're in a zip code, so you're always in that area. Yeah, yes, yeah, so just circle back around. Now, let's say I get them at home to answer the door, and now's not a good time. You know, that's, oh, you know, that's not a problem. I'm always in the area. I'll be here Saturday. I'll probably stop by Saturday morning. Is that okay with you? We you think you and your husband will both be home then? Okay, great. I'll, I'll stop by then sometime. And I don't set a specific time. I, I leave it open, you know, it's, it's Saturday morning or something. Because, again, I'm stopping by. I don't know exactly when I'll be there, but I'll be there Saturday morning. Only 10 or 15 minutes we will take care of this for you. So just real open-ended, kind of a soft set. So, um, again, this, this gentleman is a, a true – true professional in this market. Uh, I mean, he knows how to lead the clients through the process. Clients have full confidence in his ability, and he displays it. And, and again, when you walk in with this, um, you know, people gravitate towards that, and they want to do business with you. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up none other than the legend in the final expense market, Mr. B.J. Chambers. <laughs> Ray, sit down. <laughs> There you are, so next, this is door knocking, next, yeah, next one is uh, in home presentation. I, I didn't go over the actual door knocking. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I look. All right. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, door knocking, and so, um, and just real brief, for most of you know, I, I sold a lot of final spends here in the Dallas area, and 99.9% .9 of it came from direct mail leads with door knocking. Okay, so what I'm about to share with you is not from some story I read about in a final expense journal. It's from, <laughs> it's from hands-on experience uh, right here in our own backyard, guys. So the reason that door knocking works, as Jason said, is because you are more likely to get that person. That your number one goal, okay, when you're working a lead is to get to the kitchen table. That's it. So... When you have that lead in your hand, you go to the door, you're more likely to get to that kitchen table than if you pick up the phone. I've actually had a, uh, remember this lady that I was actually in the middle of writing her policy. I door knocked her, um, you know, older lady, lived by herself. She's probably, I think she's like in her late 70s. But I knocked on the door. She let me in. We sat down. And uh, I wrote her up. I mean, it was just, it was textbook. And during that uh, conversation while I'm writing the app, her phone rings. She gets up to go answer the phone. And, you know, just as a brief exchange, she hangs up the phone. She says, somebody's trying to sell me insurance. Uh, imagine that. So that could have been me on the other line calling her. So door knocking works, guys. But you have to be um, efficient about it. So one of the questions I get from agents all the time when they ask, oh, what if they're not at home? You know, I want to drive. And, and where I primarily wrote most of my um, final expense in Dallas was like along I-20. I live in McKinney. So that's not down the street. But I have a drive. 
And it, it, well, I used to live in Plano. But either way, I'm driving 40, 50 miles without a single appointment every single day. Okay? But there was very, uh, very few days that I ever came home I didn't have at least one F in my bag. And that's because they did two things. Number one, when I left the house, um, I was prepared. Um, I had a stack of, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 leads that I was going to go run for that day, sometimes more, but I, 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 whatever new leads I had in for that week and maybe some from the previous week, but I had a stack of leads and I, and I had them routed out the night before. So I knew which house I was going to in which order. So what I did, and there may be more sophisticated apps now, but I just use Map, uh, MapQuest Route Planner. You can put in up to 26 uh, addresses and sort them out. So you want to do right hand turns. I know it seems like a lot, whole lot of, yeah. But basically, if somebody wasn't at home, I could just get in a group. And I was going from house to house to house to house without having to be stopped. And, and I programmed all my GPS. I did that at night. So when I woke up, got dressed, put on my uniform. And this is, this is the reason why I'm dressed like this today. Because this is essentially, this is my spring and summer final expense uniform. So, um, <laughs> sort of semi, you know, business casual, so I didn't wear a tie, I didn't wear a suit, you don't want to look intimidating, so you want to, um, uh, you want to look professional, so this is a, you know, nice clean shirt, okay, but, um, but you don't want to look like you're the undertaker, okay, Jimmy, you look very nice, uh, but not getting, you know, we're door knocking, look like Jimmy does today, so, you got an appointment, okay, <laughs> all right, so, um, but with that, being organized is, is a big part of it, because that's what happens when people, the first question Agents will ultimately ask you, well, what if you're not at home? And, and to answer your question, you're going to circle back around because I'm, I'm in this area for the whole day. Um, and for me, and again, this is a little extra side note, I essentially uh, had my, my lunchbox, had my kit, had my bag, and lunchbox that had fruit, sandwiches, bottle of water in it because I wasn't stopping for anything except um, the bathroom, which I couldn't do that in the car. So that was the only time that I stopped. Okay. Now, with that being said, when you go to the door, uh, two things you want to remember. Because I'm going to tell you what to say, and it's really easy what, what you say. Okay, it's very simple. But the one thing you, the, the one thing you want to remember, it's most important, is really your posture, your attitude when you do it. Because as Jason said, when you go to the door, you have to understand you have a written inv invitation. And people say, well, you know, you go to somebody's house. I want to like show somebody's house unexpectedly or uninvited. Well, you're not uninvited. You're just not expected, right? Because you have an invitation. You just didn't have a time on it. So... And you have that, that mindset when you knock on the door because you're not I've, – I've had people that said no trespassing, no solicitors, uh, owner has a gun, will be shot. I knock on the door, I show them that, come on in. Yeah, so because you have an invitation. So it's all in your attitude when you knock on the door. So when you knock on the door, you have the lead in your hand. Obviously, that's a, that's a, a big one, but you have the lead in your hand. And the first thing, you're holding it up. So I got it about chest high so they can see my you know, mug along with this thing with your handwriting on it. And I say, hi, Mrs. Smith, and I'm going to use my own verbiage here, but I'm taking it out here. Hi, Mrs. Smith, my name is BJ. Uh, we received your uh, request here regarding your final spits benefits you may qualify for. Uh, I'm your assigned agent. It takes me about 10 or 12 minutes to go over your options with you. you. You mind if I come in? And I start like my foot on the mat. Now, a couple of things I did there. Number one, I said, your request. So I'm showing them what they sent in, your request. So I'm not a telemarketer. I'm not a door-to-door -door salesman. I'm not here to ask you, um, you know, with some religious pamphlets, you know, uh, any of those things. I'm here about your request for benefits that you may qualify for. So something for you. So I'm here, I'm here for your benefit, not for mine, and obviously uh, something that you requested. So if you say it like that, and then again, posture. I'm wiping my feet on the mat, and usually if they've got a screen door, I kind of reach out and I put my hand on the screen door knob. So I'm expecting to come in. And the analogy that I always use, guys, is if you had, let's say you have, I don't know, Comcast cable and you having some problems with your reception and your television, right? And so you call and he says, yeah, my picture's kind of fuzzy, so we'll see what we can do. A couple days later, a guy shows up and it says Comcast on this side, and it says Chip on that side, and he says, hey, do you mind if I come in? Are you going to tell him no? You're going to let him in because you asked for him. Now, maybe he didn't have an appointment, but he was in the neighborhood. So same thing here. This is something you requested uh, for your benefit. So if you do it that way, and if they're at home, nine times out of ten, they will let you in. The other one time out of ten, it's, it's just not a good time. Something else is going on. There's either one spouse is not there or, you know, you can hear like some uh, screaming and fighting going on in the background. <laughs> I'll kill you. <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'll be back on Thursday. <laughs> I'll be in the area. So, uh, but if you do it that way, again, posture is the biggest thing. The words you want to make sure that you talk about their requests and benefits for them. If you say that, you got that warm smile, you know, that body language that says, hey, I'm coming in. Move over. Where's the coffee? 
they'll let you in. So important to understand. And it's just to say, if you do not, if they're not at home, you put them on the same way when you're calling set appointments. You don't leave a message. You don't leave stuff behind, okay? Because you want the element of surprise, okay? Um, any questions there? All right. Now we're going to talk about the in-home presentation, guys. And again, kind of keeping that same, the same, um, same theme here. Uh, what you're really doing when you get your lead and you talk to your client is you're walking them through a process, okay? The reason you go out to their house is because that's what's in their best interest. You're here to take care of what they ask for. And you can do so a lot better uh, at their house than you can over the phone. So when you walk in, I'm going to walk you through the sales process, but a couple of key points to remember. Number one is uh, where you sit in the house. Now, if at all possible, you want to sit at the kitchen table. You heard that. That is not a, uh, a metaphor. That's a reality. When you sit at the kitchen table, we're talking about the actual kitchen table because most people, that's where they sit down to pay their bills. That's where they conduct their family business at the kitchen table. That's where they pay their bills. That's where they sit down and do their budgeting. So you don't want to, where you don't want to sit is uh, in the living room with Judge Judy going in the background uh, on the couch, okay, because that's a major distraction. And, you know, they're trying to guess the word uh, on Wheel of Fortune, and you're talking about final expense benefits. So you want to make sure you're in an area where it's um, – where you, it's free of distraction and they're paying attention to what you're saying. So the kitchen table is where you want to go, okay? Very important. Now, these steps are pretty much, you're walking, and remember this, you're walking through a process, okay? So there are seven steps to making the sale. Very simple. Number one is the warm-up. And when I say the warm-up, that's going to be a little different, you know, with each person, but basically that's a getting to know you. You know, that's your first five to seven minutes when you're sitting down. You're not going to just jump right in and say, okay, where's that checkbook at? Okay, you want to, you want this person to understand you're here for their benefit. You're a person to, um, you were, you want to get some, um, some personal interaction. And so typically what I'll normally do is I'll talk about things that we maybe have in common. You know, so 99% of the time you walk in someone's house, what's the one thing that everybody has? They have pictures of what? Family, all right? And, and if they're buying insurance, they probably have family. That's the reason why they're buying it. So I'll ask questions uh, about their family uh, and even make comments. So if they've got a, um, a grandson that plays football, uh, hey, you know, my son, he plays football in high school. And uh, well, so we have a conversation. So, again, even though I'm their insurance professional, I'm also a person, too, because I want you to think of me uh, as your friend and somebody that you can depend on, somebody that you can trust is working in your best interest. So, and people do that when you find commonalities, Right? Right? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So you go through the warm up, and again, this is just you being your natural personality. So this is something, and the one thing I will tell you from this is that you have to be genuine. And if you really care about helping people, um, that comes through. So that's not something that, um, not like a sort of magic thing. It's kind of like being friendly. You know, if you're like an unfriendly person, uh, don't work in the drive thru Okay, <laughs> it's just not. It's not for you. Okay. But if you, are, you genuinely and you're in this business because you do care about people, that shines through. So just be yourself in the, in the warm-up. Now, what you want to do is, uh, the next is explain final expense. Now, when we're sitting here at the table, uh, the one thing that I'm going to do, I'm going I'm to have a couple things on the table in front of us, okay? The first thing is the lead. So I'm going to take the lead. I'm going to put it down in front of them so they can, so that's a constant visual reminder that, hey, this is the reason why I'm here is because of your request. Uh, the other thing, and as I'm talking, we're going through the warm-up, I pull out my stack of apps, all right? Now this, and I just sort of set that, I don't make it so obvious when I set it down. I just do it casually, like I'm getting ready to start the conversation while we're talking about baseball or grandkids or what have you. So now this is sitting on the table. This is a visual, and I've got the lead right here, and I'm talking. Now, this is a, a stack of applications that I've actually written. Um, and but they're avoided checks in front of it. Now this is a, a a visual. So when I see this as a client, I'm thinking, well, number one, this guy's obviously making sales, so he must know what he's doing. And number two, other people are buying, so that gives me permission to buy. Because everybody wants, to, if everybody else is doing it, it's okay, right? If it, if you if this is your first sale, here's a little hint. Don't tell them this is your first time ever doing this, okay? Because nobody wants to hand you their avoided check. So put this out on the uh, you put that out. Okay, and that's your visual. So you, what you're going to do is when you walk through the process, you put down the, um, the co a copy of the lead, and you're going to explain to them. Okay, well, Mr. Smith, uh, what I want to do is um, kind of explain to you how final expense benefits work, okay? Uh, now, 
these type of benefits, if you qualify for them, um, they are a they're an immediate benefit. Okay, so uh, you, I'm sure you've seen those commercials for like Colonial Pen, right? Where uh, with Alex Trebek, you seen those? Okay, now those type of uh, final insurance programs are what's called guaranteed issue, which means that um, they there is no benefit or the benefits aren't uh, fully um, you don't fully get the benefits in the first two years. So you must live for at least two years in order to get the full benefits. Now, this type of final expense, if you qualify, will pay day one coverage. So if this policy is issued on Monday and something happens to you on Tuesday, your family will get the full amount, okay? Now, um, also with this type of um, uh, benefit is it is, uh, it is permanent. So your benefits will never change or decrease. Your payments will never go up. And I'm sure you've seen those uh, wonderful commercials for uh, the AARP. Um, term coverage for final expense. Yeah, now that's, again, that's term. So what that means is, is that your payment amount that you get today, it will increase at some point in time. It could be one year, it could be five years, but your payments will definitely increase. Now, with this type of final expense, if you qualify, your payments are permanent. It'll never go up for as long as you need them, okay? And uh, I know that's very important because you want to make sure you keep affordable premiums, right? Okay. So now that we understand, uh, Mrs. Smith, okay, I'm going to number three here. I'll explain the, the benefits of final expense. So now that we understand, uh, you know, what final expense is and, and how these benefits um, are, are better in that, you know, it's day one coverage if you qualify, and it's, uh, your benefits are the same, you never have to worry about your pay, premiums increasing. So we understand the what. Uh, my question to you today is the who, okay? I know when you sent this in, there was somebody you had in mind, somebody that you were concerned about, taking care of your final arrangements and, and the financial burden for them. So let me ask you, who is that? Well, I'm just, unless you ask that question, okay? And you pause, okay? Because there's a reason when they sent that in, uh, nobody's, that's not like shopping for a new car. It's not something for you. It's not something you're going to enjoy. When you fill out um, a request for final expense benefits, there's somebody you have in mind. Somebody's going somebody's gonna to have to pay for it, and that's when they fill that out. So what you're doing there is you're con getting them to reconnect with, with why they sent it in. Now, the reason I ask it that way when I ask the who is as opposed to why, because if you ask, well, oh, well, why'd you send that in? What, what are you going to get? I just want information, you know? So, and those are the, uh, those are the three I words that I don't normally use, okay? Insurance, information, and interested, okay? So instead of insurance, I say benefits, okay? Uh, when you say interested, no, they weren't interested. They want to, we want to get you covered. And you don't want to say, um, information because information comes in a pamphlet. We're going to get you covered, okay? So I stay with three I words. So you ask them that magic question. That's what the magic question is, number three. And this is a very pivotal point here. So even if you're not the smoothest uh, person in doing a warm-up and you were a little choppy with the explanation, this is absolutely vital and key uh, that you get this part right, okay? So when you ask them the who, and, and let's suppose in this case I'm talking to Mrs. Jones, and she says, well, that would be my daughter Susie. Okay, so you, but you have to get an answer. You don't move past that until you get an answer. Well, you know, I don't really know. I say, well, rephrase the question. So, you know, I, I know that there's somebody. So when this happens, because it's going to happen for all of us, right? At some point, we're going to need to be put away. Who's the um, who's going to have to pay for it? Well, that would be my daughter, Susan. Okay, and this is why they filled it out. So I'm going to move to number four. And I'm going to say, okay, and this is important. Now, how you say this? You use your own words. But this is essentially what you're going to say. Well, great. Listen, uh, Mrs. Uh, Smith, that's why I'm here. Okay, I'm here for two reasons. I'm here uh, to make sure that Susie is not left with a burden of how to pay for your, your funeral and final arrangements. Okay, but I'm also here for you to make sure you're not burdened with some premiums that are not affordable for you while you're here. Because we both can agree that this only works if it's in place when the time comes, right? Right? So... So what I'm going to do for you today, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to shop through, okay, um, all the final expense plans available, find the best option for you, and then we're going to tailor that to fit your budget, okay? Now, how I said that, number one, this is what I'm here for, for two things. I'm here for you, I'm here for Susie, and I'm here for you, and what I'm going to do for you today, so I'm not asking them anything. I'm just explaining to them what I'm going to do. They told me, you know, here's what the problem is. Here's who I'm want to get it for. Here's what I'm going to do for both you and Susie, okay? I'm going to um, shop through all the final expense plans, 
find the best one you qualify for, and then we're going to tell you that to fit your budget, okay? And 99 times out of 100, you get the same thing I got from all of you guys. It's just an automatic affirmation, a head nod, an okay. Sometimes I've gotten a thank you. I've gotten a hug at this point. Now, if you do that, you just got a soft commitment from this person because they just said to you, in effect, BJ, if you can find something I can afford, then, then get me covered today, okay? Because a lot of times in, in this, this entire process, as I said before, you're walking through a process because people don't know what to expect. So you being the professional, you're walking through this process. So once you get that soft commitment, they say, okay, all right, so what I need to do now is I'm going to ask you a few questions about your health so we can kind of determine the best program you qualify for. So then you'll go through the health questions. Now, obviously, we have a, a lot of rural neighbors here, so I'll ask them the questions. Now, one thing that I, the one thing that I will, um, that I, you don't want to do is ask them the questions verbatim because once you get them on the phone um, with rural neighbors, they're going to ask them the questions verbatim. So you want to paraphrase, paraphrase the health, <clears throat> paraphrase the, uh, the health questions. Now, kind of how I do, it, and I, I maybe paraphrase it even more, but you don't want to make sure you don't miss anything. But I ask them, you know, have you been, uh, you know, hospitalized? in the last five to seven years for any reason? Uh, have you had any major illnesses, you know, cancer, stroke, heart attack? And then what medications are you currently taking? Because that will, and the medications are usually the giveaway. So they tell you, oh, I'm healthy. I'm fine, you know. <laughs> that's been such a day in my life. Well, okay, well, let's just take any medication. Sure, I'll just take a little something for, um, they said I had dementia, but I don't feel like it. So, uh, <laughs> true story. Um, <laughs> but, um when you get those things, that'll let you know what they qualify for, okay? So you ask the health questions, and then you say, great, Mrs. Smith. You work up the, the, the uh, three options for them, okay? Now, when I work up three options, I want to do um, a couple things. When I work up three options based on their age uh, and health profile, is I try to keep the middle option around 50 or 60 bucks a month. So uh, what I'll say is, you know, once they uh, answer the health questions, okay, well, great, uh, Mrs. Smith, I'm a number six here. Uh, you qualify for a premier plan with Royal Neighbors of America. It's a great plan. Uh, this is actually the uh, plan that my mom has. She was able to qualify for this too. And I'm not lying because she does have Royal Neighbors. So, and I can say that for every carrier I have in my bag. Somebody in my family has one of these. So, and I can say that being honest. So, uh, I've got an uncle who's got um, an ultra protector. Uh, let's see. Uh, stepdad's got UHL. So, so whatever I have to come up with, I've got a family member that has this. So, there's a word to the wise. If you believe it, your family should have it too. So, so I tell them that, and, I, and you know, my mom has this, this play with rural neighbors, so um, here are your three options, you know, based on your, uh, your uh, age and the most popular options uh, for your age. So for 5000 it would be, you know, $27.91. Uh, for 10000 would be 50, 53.19, and for 15000 would be 71.45. Now, looking at these options, Mrs. Smith, which one works best for which option works best for you, and more importantly, which one works best for your budget? And you just pause there for a second. And you let them pick one. Now, one or two things are going to happen. Eight times out of ten, you're going to, they're going to pick one. And ha over half those times, they'll pick the one in the middle. That fifty-three dollars, I, I can I can swing that. That's again ten thousand. That'll, that'll cover that'll cover a funeral. That's what I was thinking. So, the minute they give me a, a buying signal, okay, great. Let me just see your driver's license. So we're going to keep walking through the process. Don't, don't stop them there. Um, and the other times that they don't give you, they may come up with a question. So, uh, so I got to give you that today. Here's the great news. I'm going to get you approved today, but you don't have to give any payment today. So which one works best, best in, your, in your budget? Well, I can afford the 53. I just don't have it today. Okay, no problem at all. Let me just see your driver's license. That's my closing. So I'll move right there. Once they pick an option, that's my closing thing. Let me see your driver's license. They get the driver's license, and that's why I'm explaining to them what we're going to do here from next. So here's how it works, okay? We get your approval today. Um, I'm going to get some additional information from you. We're actually going to call it in. I'm going to talk directly with the underwriter, and we're going to get you approved for it today, okay? And then as you're going through and filling out the, um, the app, you'll get their, you know, date of birth, social, all that good stuff. And then you get to the part about the payment. So what day would be best for you um, to do your premiums on, okay? Or at this point, I wouldn't even ask for the, what did check? And they tell me, oh, I can do it on third. I just want to get my social security check. Okay, great. So I got you down for the third for the 5319. Now I just need a voided check from you, okay? Because what we're going to do is we're going to save you some, some time and they'll just put those payments on each month on the third, okay? All right. And just kind of keep the process rolling. So the thing that you want to remember in doing this and a lot of the little things like having the checks out, 
um, helps. But the biggest things you want to make sure that you that you master right off the bat is you're walking them through a process. Okay, so your uh, confidence level that I'm gonna tell you what, if I get in somebody's house, I, I don't, it's not like I'm maybe I'll sell them something, maybe they won't. I feel like I'm going to get every single person I walk in and sit down, they're going to get a policy for me today. What I mean, why do they go through this this point? You think about all the things this person responded out of a thousand people, they're one of only fifteen people or twenty people that actually responded to this. They've let you into their house. I mean, to to talk about life insurance. This person needs coverage. So this is not something where you got a lot of tire kickers. Usually if I if I get agents tell me, hmm, I'm just for some reason, you know, I get a lot of tire kickers. People don't tire kick life insurance. You know? They don't go through that sort of problem. They're not having four or five agents come in and line up and do bids. Does it happen? Sure. But ninety nine times out of hundreds, they ain't gone this far is because um, they're looking for insurance. And it's up to you to take walk them through that process. So your your confidence level when you go in there, that's that is more than half the battle. So you've got to be confident when you're talking to them that I'm taking you through a process. Now I'm going to show you some, give you some information about insurance uh, to see if you're interested. <laughs> you just bah, 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 like three eyes in a row. You, you might as well just leave your business card on the table and go to the next house. Okay. So get your confidence level and then make sure you get that commitment before discussing price. Okay. So when you do that part, when I talk about asking that magic question, ask them the who, and then you tell them what you're going to do. And they say, okay, at that point, they've already agreed. So in, in, in using this um, very simple presentation, it's important that you get that, um, that commitment before you discuss price. Because at this point, the only problem you have is price. So if they can't afford anything on here, that when I show them the three options, I just need to find a cheaper option. Well, we I can do $2,000 for the Merico for only $17.45 a month. Is that better with your, but yeah, I can afford that. Okay, great, I just need to see your driver's license. So, but it's important you get that soft commitment. And again, as I said, there's probably, you know, 10 times you're walking them through a process. That's so important. And you don't want to get this out of order, okay? Even if you're not the, the, uh, the, the most smooth person as far as warming up and explaining the benefits, all that, if you can at least build that rapport with them and walk them through the process, if you get in there, nine times out of 10, you will walk out with an application, guys. Okay? So, I think that is, uh, okay. I think that's it. Any questions? No? We're good? So, does anyone ever say, well, why do I need final expenses if I have life insurance? Why do I need final expenses if I have life insurance? I've never gotten that question before. Okay. Yeah. Because normally if you work, because number one, the, um, the card says insurance on it. So when they mail it in, it says insurance. So they know that it's insurance. So that's important too, which is, I guess that's a good question. I've never had that because the card says insurance on it. Um, there are some, which is a huge benefit. There are some direct uh, mail pieces out there that I've seen that looks like it's something free from the government. You know, the government pays two hundred fifty-five dollars. These benefits may, you know, da -da -da, to help pay for all your funeral. And they're like, hey, I want the two hundred fifty-five dollars. Uh, how do I get that? So you have one that actually says insurance. So when they mail it in, they know it's about life insurance. So, yeah. So, well, God, let's give me that hand. Is that a phenomenal in-home presentation? Oh, okay. Do I pass the handle on now? <laughs> All right, guys. Well, again, that was a phenomenal in-home presentation. I mean, you just go through that, and, and like you said, you're going to close the majority of the people that you sit down with. We'll uh, answer that real quick after this. Um, just real quick, I wanted to touch on the carriers that are good to utilize in the final expense market. Rural neighbors in America. Now, of course, we have other carriers for other situations that you may run into. But if you have these two carriers in your back pocket, you pretty much got some of the best products on the market. As far as overall, as far as covering, uh, you know, medical challenges, as far as making sure that you have the best premium in the home, because everybody wants the best price. You know, and you're going to be super competitive with these two carriers. They're very easy to work with. They're very easy products to learn. Again, all of this kind of goes hand in hand as to why we've elected these carriers and these products. So with that, hopefully you enjoyed today's training on the uh, final expense market, how to handle telemarketing, direct mail, door knocking, and things to that effect. We're going to go ahead and, uh, for those of you that are online, we're bringing the training to a close. I want to thank everyone for attending, and uh, have a great day.